add some data to a leaflet map. We're going to do that in two different ways. Follow along. Um, right now we have a leaflet map that is just a base map. Not much going on. We want to bring some other data to it. Uh, that might be data that we downloaded, data that we created, data that we modified in some way. Either way, um, this process should work for you. Um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to open up a file that I want to open on my web map. This is, these are bicycle routes in New York. And I want to get these in a format that will work for a web map. And right now they're in a shape file that I got from NYC Open Data, um, which is totally fine for sharing data, but if I want it on a web map, usually I want it as a GeoJSON file. So I'm going to export Save Features As. This is in QGIS. Uh, I'm going to use the format GeoJSON and pick a place to save it. I'm going to call it Bike Routes. And save it. And this is uh, this is the file that we just exported. You can see it's 12.7 megabytes, pretty large, usually larger than what you're going to want someone to have to download in order to see your map. So there are a couple of ways of getting around this. Um, the first thing my go-to is going to be look at the attribute table. Do I need all of the columns in here. For my purposes, I'm mostly just showing the bike routes, but I might also want the facility class and, and the text describing what that is like. Um, so I might come in here, edit and delete fields and select everything except for the ones that I want. And you'll see that's taking a second. And um, instead of saving it right there, I'm going to export as a new file. Call it viewer columns. Okay, and let's see how big that is. Uh, so that's about 4.9 megabytes, still on the large side. Um, the other thing you can do, if you're so inclined, is you can go up to Vector Geometry Tools and Simplify. And when you're simplifying, you're saying remove nodes that we don't really need in order to see the shape of these lines. That might be the appropriate thing here if they're if the lines are very detailed but you're not going to be showing them in at a resolution where you're going to see that that would probably be my next move another thing you might look into is if i select some of these with the identify features tool what you're going to see with some data is that each of these is uh another um, each of these features is it's a number of small features that actually represent more or less the same feature so um, this can get really large in a GeoJSON um, if you have five or 50 um, line segments to find as separate features in a GeoJSON those start to take up a lot of space um, if you have 50 smaller line segments for each line, it's going to be 50 times larger, more or less. Um, so you could also consider going up to vector and geoprocessing tools and dissolve. So if you had a unique ID, like the bike ID, perhaps you could dissolve based on the bike ID. And let's do that just to see what that looks like. And I'm going to do that as a temporary layer. 
And let's see if I select one of these now. You see these are much larger segments. They don't necessarily go the whole way, uh, but they are significantly um, larger. And that might be what we want. That might be the appropriate thing to do. Let's try ex exporting this one as another GeoJSON, call it fewer columns dissolved. See what the fi file size difference is. Yeah, so it's half the size, two megabytes. Let's use that one. Great. So I'm working in a platform called Glitch. Uh, this is a handy place to create simple web projects uh, with HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. If I want to load this GeoJSON file that I have on my computer, um, the best way to do that is to add it as an asset in your Glitch project. Usually assets are images and things like that. In this case, if I copy that and open it in a new tab, you'll see this is actually a text file that contains all of the information that was in our spatial layer that we were just looking at. So you can look at the properties, you can actually see the geometry, you can see all of the lines that make up one of these. Uh, this is actually a pretty small one. These are the coordinates that make up the line. Great. So I want to hold on to that URL because I need that URL. I'm going to load it in my JavaScript. So I'm actually going to say, hey JavaScript, I need some other data in order to display what I need. The nicest way to do that right now is using a function called fetch. This will fetch whatever is at the other end of that URL. That might take a moment. So it's going to, uh, it promises that it will return a value eventually. Um, so what we say is, uh, once you're done, dot then, we'll add a dot then after the fetch and give it a function that will ret run once that response is given to us. So fetch this URL, then do something. In our case, we're returning, we're getting text as a response, but we really want is an, a JavaScript object that we can work with. And this is very typical when loading data this way, return response.json. And then, because that also t could take some time, then we are running another function. This will actually contain the data that we loaded. Okay, so we're getting the data. Um, we don't see it on the map yet. If we look in developer tools, you're not going to see too much, but you will see here in the network tab that it's loading the data. And if you look in the response, you'll see some of the data there. Maybe not all of it. Great. So we need to tell Leaflet, hey, we have this data. Please put it on my map. So um, the quickest way to do this in Leaflet, if you go to the documentation for Leaflet, here under other layers is GeoJSON. This is the most common way to do this if you're loading GeoJSON data. And uh, we could copy all of this, but really all we need for our purposes right now is create a GeoJSON layer and dot add to map. So we're creating a layer, adding it to the map so that it will display in theory. And it did work. Phew. Um, so that's, uh, that is how you create a GeoJSON, get it into shape that you can use it in, and then get it on a leaflet map. Great. Uh, you can see here that there are other things that you might need to do. For example, the GeoJSON um, function takes uh, 
an object of options, which you can add here. And this is usually how it gets indented. You can see one, the only option we're using right now is one called style. And um, we could just say color is, let's start with green just to make sure that's doing anything at all, and it is great. Um, if we needed to do something more uh, complicated, you would look here under the options. These are the options when you're creating the GeoJSON layer. Come down to Style, look at Path Options, and these have all of the options that you can use in Leaflet. Great, so we loaded a file in with GeoJSON. Those are the steps that you'll usually take. Create your leaflet map as you would usually, add a base map to it, and then fetch some data at this URL. Then create a, um, parse it as JSON. Then once that is parsed, put it on the map. I will point out that fetch is a standard that uh, is not supported by older browsers. So if you want to support older browsers, I recommend looking into what are called polyfills. These will add new functionality to older browsers. Basically, it's a JavaScript library that takes care of the new functions. So loading these two things, I am supporting older browsers that otherwise um, would not be able to view my page. So that's how we're using fetch. Great, so that's how you um, create a GeoJSON file, load it, put it on your map. What if we wanted um, to get data from, say, just for example, an open data portal. For sure, one way of doing this would be to export it, download it as, say, in this case, a CSV file, and um, load that CSV in a GIS, filter it, export it as a GeoJSON, do that process that we just did, that would totally work. But what if we're just experimenting and we just want to see part of the data on a map or we want to dynamically load certain parts of the data? In that case, you might want to use an API. In the case of NYC Open Data, it runs on a platform uh, that is um, created by a company called Socrata which has an open data API, SODA for short. And uh, you can look at the documentation for that. And there's a documentation page for each open data data set that will show you more or less how to use the, um, the API. So, what we're going to do is try to load this data. Um, if you know the 3-on-1 data, you know that um, there's a lot of it. As of this recording, over 22 million records, which is a lot. So you never want to load all of the data. Um, Definitely not for this. Um, so what we will do is filter it somehow. And when you're looking at the API, you can see that um, the field names are specified here. So if we were looking at unique key, we would use unique underscore key. If you look in the documentation here, um, they also have the fields. And you can see, um, for example, um, here is how you would query for one specific unique key. We can open that in a new tab. We can see exactly what that returns, right? It's actually getting us 
the data for that one particular record. And in our case, one nice thing about certain data sets um, is that you can say, actually give me the GeoJSON. And the way I did that was up here, uh, if you look at the after the dot here, we had JSON. We're going to change it to GeoJSON and keep the query intact the way it is. And you'll see that it is loading it in that, that format that we want. And I'm actually going to add it as an overlay to our data. Hopefully this will uh, load as expected. I'm going to make it red to be to make it distinctive. Um, but I'm going to all I need to do is change this URL. Now we're loading both the bike routes and some th random 3-on-1 data by unique key. And you'll see, hey, um, I didn't need to add red because, of course, uh, the default in Leaflet is to add a marker like that. So you can see exactly where that 3-on-1 request came through. Great. So filtering by unique key, kind of boring. Uh, really what we want to do is um, maybe look at complaint types. Maybe look at um, the descriptors. Currently, you can see there are some 3 on one complaints about social distancing. Um, so we could say where the descriptor is equal to social distancing. distancing. <laughs> Um, and we might test that out just right here in a tab. We might say, instead of unique key, say descriptor or equals social distancing. Let's see how that goes. That loaded some data um, and it got hidden here, but you can see there are numerous features matching that. And we can just add that here. Again, all I'm doing is changing that URL that Fetch was using. Now you can see all of the markers. This is getting to the point where it's maybe, uh, maybe it's too much data for what we need. Um, another way that you can filter, uh, I just want to see if that's here. Yes, great. So if you're looking in the API documentation, there is a parameter called where, dollar sign where, which is a whole lot like using SQL. So if you know SQL, you're in luck. You can just say where the equal sign and then write some SQL that you would write in a where clause. You can see here, if you're looking at earthquakes, you're saying where magnitude is greater than 3.0 and the source is PR, right? That is this URL. Um, so we could do something similar. We might want uh, just the latest data, right? Maybe just the latest data where the descriptor is social distancing. So. Um, Instead of descriptor, I'm going to say dollar sign where equals, and then um, descriptor equals. Okay, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Um, what you will need to do is encode this equal sign because the computer on the other end here is going to get confused when you have an equal sign and then another equal sign. You need, to, you need to distinguish between these equal signs. Um, the easiest way to do that is in the console, you can encode URI component and put the equal sign there. You can see uh, it returns percent %3D, um, which is the code that you'll see in URLs whenever a percent sign should be showing up. When you actually want um, when you actually want it to be interpreted as a percent sign on the other side, not by the browser or the server. 
Um, and when I run that, you can see I'm getting an error. And that error is because, um, think back to your um, SQL knowledge, if you have some, uh, you need strings to be wrapped in quotation marks. And that should do it. So now we're saying where descriptor is equal to social distancing. Maybe we want to say and, sorry about that, and create a date is um, the past couple of days, right? So we can say and created date greater than or equal to, um, so percent 3D, 2020, 04, 19. Let's start there and see what happens. Uh, no errors. Uh, so I think that worked. Let's come back in here, change the URL one more time. You can see this URL is getting ugly. So um, there are a couple of ways of handling that. Let's make sure it's working first. Okay. It doesn't seem any smaller. Um, <clears throat> and if you're not sure if your filtering is working correctly, you can mess around with, uh, right now it's um, up to af after the 19th. Uh, I just changed it to be greater than or equal to the 21st. Um, and now nothing's showing up. Let's try the 20th. Okay, that's, uh, that's maybe a little bit more like what I expected, something like that. And then the 19th, just a whole lot on the 19th and not so many on the 20th. That could be a lag in the data. Um, if we look over at the original data source, and go to about and scroll down. It might tell us uh, when it was last updated. It says, it says it's updated daily. So there's a chance we're nearing uh, midnight here. Maybe it's going to get updated in the morning at some point. Uh, but you can also check the created dates up here. You can see um, it looks like the most recent data, if this is accurate, is uh, very early yesterday morning. So 2 a.m. yesterday, um, since, so in the first two hours of yesterday, there were this many uh, social distancing complaints, it seems like, um, but hopefully you get the idea. You could, uh, for example, make an interface where somebody picks the date and you show just the complaints for that date, or somebody picks from a drop down the different descriptors that you're interested in showing, or maybe a handier search interface that's a little bit more flexible than this one. Um, the, the options um, become pretty uh, pretty numerous once you get to the point where you're coming down to export and instead of just downloading the file and doing something with it, look at the API and see what's available there. Great, so I hope that seeing those two options uh, gives you an idea of other ways that you can load data in a leaflet map.